All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and we're just getting started this morning. So welcome, everybody that's checking in, uh, that's liking this video. Uh, please let folks know. Yeah, it's been a while since you've been able to catch us. I uh, love you, Gina. Uh, Brother David Jacobs, our board member there, and uh, others who will be joining us this morning. Uh, I have a lot to say today. I don't mean as in any longer than any other period of time, but I have a lot on my heart. My heart is full of the goodness of God. My heart is full of the revelation of, war, of the word. And the reality is, is that I am growing in revelation knowledge, just like you're growing in revelation knowledge. I don't know everything, but the things that I do know or that I believe I know, I want to share with you because revelation is a process. It's we're growing together. Uh, truth is being unveiled in us together. We're coming to know the realities of the father's heart together. And that's what this study is so exciting to, uh, for me uh, is so exciting. Uh, so to, today, everybody, just again, this is Dr. Bill with World Bible School, and welcome to Take Another Look, where we are going back and taking another look at the book of Revelation. What I mean by that is we've seen many traditional views, many legalistic and religious views of the book of Revelation, but we're going back to see what is so different. Now, we're in chapter 14, and we're about to finish up chapter 14 today, and next week, hopefully, we'll have this done, and next week, we'll be in chapter 14. 15. But here's the thing, folks, uh, seven more chapters to go. So we've come a long way in the book of Revelation. This is lesson number 116. And we've come a long way in the book of Revelation. And now I want to go back and teach it all over again, because I've learned so much and you've learned so much and different things have happened. And so in this ongoing series, we are taking a spiritual journey through the book of Revelation, verse by verse. And many are starting to watch this show, maybe not as much as some of my other shows, but people are interested. They want to know truth. They want to know what's going on. And uh, the, th the reality is, is that the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. It's a spiritual book. And you have to be willing to take a spiritual plunge, as it were, into some things that are unheard of, that are different, that doesn't sound like the norm. Because, folks, let's face it, we have a Bible that is so mistranslated over many hundreds of years that here we are face to face with revelation that's flowing and we can no longer ignore them. Yes, there's many things in scripture that doesn't belong, many things that were taken out years ago that does belong. So here we're faced with see, searching out the truths of God. So in this series, I'm teaching what I believe Holy Spirit has shown me. And if you're joining me for the first time and somebody watching this video today, whether live or after the fact, will be seeing me teach this for the first time. What we're looking at is the events surrounding the Apostle John as he experiences a new dimension of the heavenly realms, not really known before by natural man, but of course, as supernatural beings, we've always known the supernatural realm. And so we're seeing what we can learn from what John is experiencing. Just keep in mind that I'm teaching the book of Revelation completely from the idea that this is the unveiling of the anointed one and how he uh, how he uh, actually interacted with humankind and why he came and things like that, that we'll be getting into a lot more as we go along. So keep in mind that this is the unveiling of the anointed one in you. And uh, we're seeing what I define as the, the as revelation being the unveiling of the father's heart. What's in the father's heart or what we could say to make that more clear is what is on the father's mind. What's in his mind, because what's in his mind is in your mind. Uh, it may not be to the forefront of your mind, but we're coming to light with the knowledge of truth. So I'm asking folks just to consider the scriptures along with the supporting evidence so that we can um, so that we can really get this revelation. So let's get started today as we try to finish up chapter 14 in Revelation 14, verse 17 through 20, reading from the New King James Version says, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. Now, heaven is a Greek word that's really pronounced similar to oranas. And it means the abode of God. 
And so if I were to ask you today, where does God live? You would tell me that he lives in you. And you're right. Heaven is not a place that's far off in a galaxy somewhere way up in the sky. Uh, uh, when we talk about clouds, we're talking about two things. We might be talking about atmospheric clouds or we might be talking about the glory cloud. You have to know the definition of the word in the original language. And so it's the abode of God. That's what it means. The abode of God is in you. He is also having a uh, also having a sharp sickle. This word sickle is the Greek word uh, repanon, meaning a gathering hook. So we want to find out what that's about. It's not a hook of death. It's not a slice of death. It's not a murder weapon. It is a gathering hook. So we want to see that. All right, in verse 18, and another angel came out of the altar who had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who led who had the sharp sickle saying thrust in your sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe now we saw this in previous verses as we've been studying we've seen where he said that the harvest the harvest of the earth is ripe uh, go go uh, put in your sickle and and bring in the harvest uh, not talking about death not talking about destruction not talking about some antichrist not even mentioned in the book of revelation but talking about a gathering a reaping all right and then he says in verse 19 so the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and, and gathered the vine of the earth past tense i want you to pay attention to that gathered the vine of the earth uh, and threw it into a great, the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now, right here, it sounds terrible. We'll be talking about this, but I want you to think about this because the next verse, verse 20, really brings some definition and some clarification when we talk about the life of Jesus. Uh, and so here he says, that verse 20, and the wine press was trampled outside of the city. Now, based on history, let me ask you, where did Jesus die? Where was he sacrificed? Was it in the city or was it outside the city? Well, it was outside the city of Jerusalem. And so this speaks of the wine press was trampled outside the city and blood came out of the wine press. Jesus was our wine press. He came out of the wine press up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 furloughings. Now, furloughing, we'll probably look at this later, but it's the Greek word, stadion meaning a certain measure of distance yet in this case 1600 furloughs equals to about 184 miles now as we approach the end of chapter 14 here in this same chapter john saw three angels which we've already seen we're going to look at something else but he already saw these three angels um and and keep in mind that uh, as he saw these three angels um, uh, this word angels is translated messenger, which we'll look at in just a, a moment or two. Uh, but uh, the first one had the everlasting gospel, which is said to be the gospel of the ages, which was proclaimed to the rulers and leaders of earth dwellers. So <clears throat> when we're talking about the religious leaders of that day, we're talking about Roman emperors. Uh, we're talking about magistrates. Uh, the second messenger proclaimed a sobering message, uh, a life-shaking message, which was that Babylon was in a fallen condition. The religious system was coming down. Now, at this moment in time, it's not saying that Babylon has fallen, uh, but Babylon's about to fall. Uh, and, um, and we know that that happened in AD 70. The third messenger is said to have, have revealed the fiery process of divine judgment upon all who persist and worshiping the beast and his image and bearing its mark. Again, we're talking about the Roman gov government. We're talking about the government of that day that insisted that people can carry a mark on their right hand or their forehead uh, to even buy or sell in their marketplaces. It was a system of rulership, a system of control in that day. It's not talking about any futuristic mark of a beast. As a matter of fact, beast, again, uh, can, refer, can refer to the beast of that day, the Roman emperors or the empire itself, or the word beast can refer to uh, the beast of our earthly nature, uh, of our, our uh, unrenewed thoughts. And the mark is talking about a mark 
spark that's printed uh, in your thinking. And that's what we're trying to change is a mindset. I mean, I'm just giving you the facts of what it means. So again, John sees these three angels, angelas, uh, also translated messengers, which uh, which um, uh, uh, matches in description to the first three messengers we've seen. Now he sees another one. Uh, in the first series of three uh, messengers, uh, they call out with a loud voice to the rulers of the earth to fear God. We saw this in a few weeks ago, to fear God and to give him glory for the hour of judgment has come. The messenger also says to worship him who made heaven and earth and the seas and springs of water. However, the voice of this messenger is directed to the one who sits on the cloud and whose voice is crying for the great purpose of God and his people to be consummated. Now, I want you to think about this. Here's the reason why, and we'll, we'll get into this a little bit. The reason why is that because the grain harvest of the earth, AKA mankind is ready to be reaped or harvested. What is God trying to harvest uh, prior to AD 70? What is God trying to harvest in the process of the death of Christ all the way to uh, AD 70? We're talking about a change of mindset from a religious system to a God system. Uh, we're talking about how that these messengers, but keep in mind the messenger and the message are one. We looked at that months ago. The message and the messengers become one. And so now the messenger is proclaiming the message. And we see this one who sits on a cloud. And it's and the scriptures read that one uh, like one who sits on a cloud, meaning it's not the one, capital O N E, but it's it's our oneness with the mind that is in Christ oneness with God. And then John saw a second messenger coming out of the temple of heaven, bearing a sickle, signifying the moving of the Holy Spirit within, in us. See, when we talk about the earth, we need to be careful that we're not thinking about physical planet earth, the, the round ball that you're glued to by gravity, but we're talking about the earthiness that is in mankind, carnal thinking, wrong thinking. And so he says to bear, bring a sharp sickle signifying the moving of the Holy Spirit within, including the activity of the lamb reaping the harvest of the vine of the earth. So we're talking about mankind. We're talking about man's carnal thinking. We're talking about a change of mindsets. And the third angel is described as coming from the altar and he has power and authority over fire. So here in, this is the, the, the setup for what we're looking at. Now, as we look at verse number 18, it says, and another angel came from the altar who had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. Writer and commentator Jay Preston Evie says this, to understand these mysteries of the eternal, of, of internal importance, eternal importance, for until we do understand them, we will be in, in, uh, ineffectively, ineffectual in our ministry as the priesthood of God. I would draw your attention to three specific items in connection with this third scene. There is an altar, an angel, and fire. So think about those three things. And then he says, we must be very certain about the identity of these three items, the setting of the holy place the location of the golden altar within the typical tabernacle of Moses and later in the temple of Jerusalem. It was uh, stationed just before the veil of entrance into the most holy place of the throne of God over the Ark of the Covenant from whence God uh, proceeded God's mercy and the throne of the mercy seat. So here's the thing, folks. What is the significance of the altar, the fire, and the sickle of this harvest. Well, for me, the golden altar of incense was made of wood overlaid with pure gold, which speaks of a pure righteousness of God that is in us. You have been made the righteousness of God in your thinking. But think about this also, and I, I, I don't want to get other broadcasts um, uh, in, intertwined with this broadcast, but what we've been teaching of late on other broadcasts is how that who we are 
is who we've always been since the day that God made man in his image and likeness, or the Hebrew says in God's mirrored reflection. Think about this. If God made you a spirit being uh, from before the foundations of the earth, you say, wait a minute, Dr. Bill, I thought that was Adam. The Greek word Adam is the actually the English word used there when God created man, or it's translated mankind. So Adam, which we say Adam, but Adam is not Adam the man, but, but mankind. And so if there was an Adam and an Eve, then they were a part of that creation of mankind. But all of these spirit beings, whoever were in eternity past, all the way through to eternity future, which eternity past has no beginning, eternity future has no end, Every spirit being, every person, whether aborted, whether living, whether died, uh, whether preceded us in death, uh, whether is in our future not born yet, every spirit being was released out of who God is with the same mind, the same thoughts, the same passions as Father God has. We come into this earth realm and it's like we kind of forgot who we were. But let me ask you this, just because a person gets amnesia, uh, does that mean they're not who they've always been? Of course not. So as a spirit being, you are who you've always been. But the fact is, folks, that um, when we look at this, uh, you are not seeing a new you, but you're seeing that Jesus came to save the Jews but he also came to redeem man in his thinking. So here we are, we're being redeemed in our thinking. My thinking is not 100% like God's at this moment in time, although that mind is within me. The Bible said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. What's he talking about? He's not talking about having the mind of Christ as much as he is talking about having the mind that Christ has. And whose mind is Christ at? He has the mind of his father. That's the mind that is in us and the mind we need to be paying attention to. Now, the altar is said to be about three feet high and one and one half feet square. Uh, the altar is said to have been the tallest piece of furniture in the holy place. And for me, it is symbolic of the highest point of our understanding and the embracing of our priestly position. So as we've been reading this morning, looking at these few scriptures, surely you can see the, the, the revelation of the ministry of priesthood rising up. We are the ministry of the Lord. We are the priesthood of the Lord. And I want to talk to you about your responsibility as the priesthood, not prior to AD 70, but right now in 2019, soon approaching 2020, a place that mankind never thought we would arrive to. If mankind would have had his way, we'd have been raptured out, killed, destroyed, uh, our heads chopped off by some antichrist mindset uh, a long time ago. But mankind was wrong because here we are, and we're going to continue on in this ministry. We're going to continue on living, and people are going to continue living longer and longer and longer, and people out of the supernatural realm are going to continue to manifest in this natural realm, or we're going to continue to manifest uh, and be able to see and interact more and more with that supernatural realm. Just like Dr. K. Fairchild says, we are a spirit being slowed down to visibility. We are spirit being slowed down to visibility. So in other words, people are able to see us and interact with us just like we can with others. And there's a lot there. That's another lesson, but a lot there that needs to be addressed over time. Amen. Okay. Now, <clears throat> um, on top of the altar rests a pen shaped vessel uh, called the golden censer on which coals or uh, pieces of burning wood uh, are taken from the brazen altar in the outer court. Now, th there's a lot to be said about the outer court versus the inner court, uh, and then versus the most holy place. Uh, there's a lot of details about the scriptures that we read that we're not going to tear apart verse by verse, but we're going to continue with the concept, with the essence of these verses as we've been doing. So what happens next is that the priest fills his censer with the, with the fresh coals and puts on incense every morning and every evening, kind of a old covenant ritual, so that day and night uh, there would be 
a sweet odor going to God. See, God's not about smoke and fire in terms of a natural smoke and fire like they understood God. So what happened was is man, God revealed himself to mankind, but mankind misinterpreted what God was revealing. And then we got all these religious customs and, and so on uh, that have been integrated into uh, our, uh, the religious system of our world. The action we're talking about was known as a perpetual incense before the Lord as taken from Exodus 30 verse eight, which says Aaron shall burn incense on it, a perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. So how is this applicable to those who are under a new covenant mindset? Think about that. Verse 18 from the Message Bible, Revelation 14, 18 from the Message Bible says, Swing your sharp sickle, harvest earth's vineyard. The grapes are bursting with ripeness. Now, of course, we're reading the second part of verse 18 from the, uh, the, the Tree of Life version. It says, Put in your sickle and gather the grape clusters from the vineyard of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So it's obvious that this angel, a.k.a. messenger, from out of the altar signifies the priestly ministry of the sons of God on behalf of the vine and the vineyard of the earth. So what are we talking about? Is, is there a, a, a rescuing or is there a harvest in the earth that still remains? Well, let me just say this to you folks. What remains is, and I'll address it this way. There is a message coming forth today that talks about our oneness with God, that talks about our unif unifying mindset with the Father. Uh, there is a message today that talks about God's unlimited grace, God's unlimited man, uh, uh, love for all creation, not just for some, not just for those who say, I'm a Christian, because every time you say, I'm a Christian, you segregate yourself and you exclude somebody else. When you say I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat or I'm a liberal, you do that and you exclude somebody else. When you say I'm a Muslim, you exclude somebody else. But what we are is the creation of God. We are the creation of God who have God in us and as having God in us, what we're saying is, as we are the children of God, the creation of God, we are the express image of our father, just like Jesus did. And so Jesus was the express image of his father. And he says that we're no longer uh, servants, but he calls us friends. But ultimately what we find out in scripture is we're the heirs of God, but we're also joint heirs or equal heirs of Jesus Christ or exact replicate or duplicates of Jesus Christ. And what's that mean? That means that father God uh, created us. And with my example, that he takes his cell phone and he takes a selfie of himself. And when he does that, uh, you know what? I'm just going to, I'm going to even make that different here. I'm going to uh, do a little demonstration here. If I can figure out how to reverse my camera. There it is. Okay. And I'm going to take a selfie. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that right here on camera. Okay. And I'm going to turn that around. Uh, let's see, pull up a picture. Okay. And I'm going to show you. Okay. Right there, that picture. Okay. That's me. It's blurry and the lights and everything keep it from going clear, but that's me. I am the selfie of myself. I am the express image of what you just saw in the camera. But it doesn't mean that I'm not like God. It means I am the a expression of God. One writer wrote, uh, one teacher wrote that when when we look at the uh, the scripture in Psalms that says we are created a little lower than the angels. It doesn't mean lower uh, than angels, but but basically a hair with difference than Elohim. It's not angels there. It's Elohim, the Godhead or or God. And so a hair with difference uh, where the express image of our father. Now, in saying that, some know that and some do not. Some want to embrace that, but aren't ready to embrace that. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, honestly, I hate this to be in my teaching, but, you know, apparently my wife is flirting with me on camera online this morning. So <laughs> uh, I'm assuming she's talking about the, my selfie. Uh, so is there, is there, is there a rescuing or a harvest in the earth that still remains? Now think about that. 
You talk about Jesus did it all, but let's go bigger than that. Father God created you just like himself. All mankind is created just like the father. Uh, many don't know that. Many don't want to know that. Many think that's sacrilegious uh, to know that. But the fact is, folks, it's the truth. So is there a rescuing that still has to go on? Uh, so my answer is yes, but my answer is also no, in that we have been rescued by way of who we have uh, been created as in our father. But also in this uh, rescuing, uh, that this rescuing will continue as long as there are those who do not understand who they were designed to be from before the foundation of the world. Uh, I think about it this way. We have all said at one point in time, if I had only been taught that as a child, but think about the future generations who will actually teach their children all of this, th these things and more. They'll teach them the message of who they are in God. They'll teach the message of how they're like their father. And one day children will be born into this world and all they will be taught is truth and nothing else. And they will be raised up to believe that they're just like God. So you see, here's the problem. Religion has blinded the minds of people from seeing truth. You say, well, that, that Satan has blinded the minds of those who don't, do not believe. Well, the, the, you have to understand that that's not talking about, um, uh, and the answer is yes, you can see this later on YouTube after I get it loaded and uh, shared to Facebook, there'll be a link. Uh, so uh, the, the thing is, is that you're just like your father and religion has taught you to embrace something other than truth. Uh, Satan did not blind, the Satan, the deceiver, the, uh, did not blind people's minds in terms of a supreme deity. We're talking about how that the system of that day was preventing people from knowing truth by preaching lies to them. Okay, that's what they did in that day. And so the reality is, folks, that that because of religion, there remains those who do not want to embrace truth because religion tells them it's bad, it's wrong to embrace the truth. But see, truth makes you free and totally dependent upon the God who lives in you and is integrated into your life. However, by clinging to religion, you will be dependent upon uh, something uh, uh, other than the mind of Christ that's when you, within you. Again, the mind of Christ means the mind that Christ had, which was the mind of his father. See, here, here's the thing. And I, and I, I don't want, I don't want to get into pet me clubs, uh, that, that it's going to be okay. Uh, keep believing what you're believing. You know why? Because religion provides a kind of support group mentality so that a person can lean upon someone else's ideas and someone else's theologies. Now, as a Bible college instructor and founder of World Bible School University, I know that I teach and I know when my students hear my lessons, they've got to take a final exam and they need to know the answers of the lesson that I have taught. If they don't, it's a mark against them. But in reality, they need to understand that they need to continue these studies and move forward with these studies and getting more revelation even beyond what they have been taught. See, you are a son of God, AKA sons and daughters who are kings and priests of God. You're a king and a priest in this earth. You're not a pauper. You are a king and a priest of the Lord Jesus Christ and of our God. And you reign right now in this earth realm. But I wanna tell you, many people have attempted this concept of reigning in life and they've done it with the wrong mindset. They've done it by engaging the wrong mindset. You're going to have to engage the mindset that says you're just like your father, that you think like your father, that you have the personality, the, 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 the passions of your father. See, the messenger of the Lord, uh, as the messenger of the Lord, which is who you are, your mission is to show others who they are and what their purpose is in this earthly realm. And that purpose is to affect change in the way people think. Now, you say, Dr. Bill, do you have it all down yet? Oh, absolutely not. I'm still learning. I teach, I, I, I teach people who want to learn, but I also listen to people who I can learn from. So we're all, every one of us, continuing to grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
you are empowered to thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth and for her grapes are fully ripe. So the priestly mantle of sons of God revealed in the book of Revelation had the power over fire or of a fiery word in their mouths. A fiery word that burns with passion, but also a fiery word that when spoken through a camera or to a congregation or to, on national television, that fiery word produces a, a drawing, a compelling uh, a, to change one's mindset from what one has believed into the truth of God. Because whatever you think you believe, it really doesn't matter unless it lines up to what Father God actually thinks, unless it lines up to his nature, being a loving heavenly father. Now, uh, I love that, that comment there, intertwined one with God. It's exactly right. It's not just being one with God uh, in a veiled sense, but you are fully one with your father. Thank you very much for that comment. Now, what was known, uh, commonly known as the Old Covenant, uh, the, the, the care of the fire was uh, part of the priest's duties of the old. Leviticus 6, verse 12 in the New King James says, For, And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. It shall not be put out, and the priest shall burn wood on it every morning and lay the burnt offering in uh, order on it, and shall be burned on the burn uh, shall burn on it the fat of the peace offerings now think about that that the reality is, is there was a priestly duty a priestly responsibility i'm really only highlighting on the responsibility i'm not highlighting on the religious aspect of it how to lay the sacrifice all out in a certain order everything had to be in a proper order and putting the the, the piece of fat on there for a peace offering and every morning this had to be done and so, and a priest was assigned to this duty, not just one, but several assigned to this duty. So remember the, the, the fire upon the golden altar is the same fire as the fire of the brazen altar, which was taken from there and just transferred to another. And so we have a priestly responsibility. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, uh, the man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You are one flesh with the father and you're becoming one in your thinking in that it's not God's mind that changes, it's your mind that changes. Amen. So this fire was carried into the holy place by the priests of that day, which had the authority and responsibility over the fire over the fire now i want you to think about this you have the the authority and the responsibility out of the word of fire that comes out of your mouth uh the the, the evidence uh that the, 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 there is evidence throughout the book of revelation that the altar refers to the golden altar in the heavenly holy place which is in you not the brazen altar of the outer court mentality which is an earthly realm concept in you is the heavens in you is the throne. In you, you have made a throne. You have made a dwelling place for the Father. You have made a place for the worship of our God. You are to no longer live in an outer court mindset. And that's because you reside in the most holy place where Father lives in you. That's right. A spirit being inside this body dwells with the father you sit down and have coffee every morning with the father if, if you want to think of it that way you might sit down and have a hot tea with the father every morning or my wife would say have hot chocolate with the father every morning uh and when i say morning we're not talking about a geographical earthly mindset of the sun rises but but on a day-to-day -day basis, you might sit and have Bible study with the Father, just discussions with the Father. But you do that in that realm. You say, but Dr. Bill, people just don't know about those concepts. Well, they would understand it better if they begin to think that way. They begin to, to have their mind on those things. Amen. So many people still live with an outer court mindset, a natural thinking mindset, thinking that they are something other than what God says they are. But look, folks, it's not just in this earthly realm, but as one who was birthed 
and lives in the supernatural realm where while even while dwelling in this earthly realm so yes you dwell in this earthly realm in a natural sense but remember if we go by what i said <laughs> if i go by what we said earlier that you are a spirit being slowed down to visibility uh, you operate in a realm that's not visible to the natural realm unless you become spiritually sighted. You have that ability in you. So you are a spirit being slowed down to visibility. So in other words, you, you don't think sometimes like you're of that other realm, but you need to think that way because the spirit realm and the natural realm actually are intertwined. Uh, they're in the same place. It's just a matter of what realm you pay attention to. Amen. So, you have authority, the authority of your father in all realms because you have the fire of the burning altar within you, which is the energizing, quickening, transforming presence, the word and the power of Father God himself, who is a consuming fire living in flesh. Did you hear that this morning? He, you are a consuming fire living in flesh. Praise the Lord. Amen. And speaking of coffee, mm, that's good. All right. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Now, writer and commentator Jay Preston Eby says the fire was the energizing of God himself. Think about the energizing of God himself, that same energizing that's in you. Uh, energizing of God himself by the spirit. The fire is the fire burning the incense upon the golden altar the sweet smelling smoke of which goes up before God with the prayers of the saints. This signifies the, a powerful ministry uh, and, and uh, effectuous moving of God on behalf of his people who have been dwelling in the earth realm who are also called the vine of the earth. The two angels then who act together in a matter of the vintage uh, uh, are, are of one spirit, both are charged with a kind of reaping and gathering. The altar, uh, the angel of the altar uh, calls with a loud voice to his companion. And, and that's, I, I believe that's us speaking to one another in that supernatural realm. And the burden of their mission is that the clusters of the vine of the earth be gathered for her grapes are fully ripe. So listen, this is like hearing a commission. And I hope you're hearing this clear uh, because um, uh, it's so, so important. But here's the fact, folks. You are commissioned to swing your sharp sickle in that the harvest of that age happened. Now I want you to hear this. The harvest of that age happened. In other words, Jews who didn't embrace Jesus can now embrace Jesus, which embracing Jesus will lead you to embracing the Father. And now the harvest of the mindsets of people is our mission. Look, I can't make anybody change the way they think. First of all, I don't understand it all. I'm, I'm working on it. I don't understand it all, but I, my mission is not to make you think the way I think. Even if I have thoughts let's say that i have collected 10 thoughts that are identical to what the father thinks and i've got 90 other thoughts that aren't quite there yet even if i have those 10 thoughts i can't make you think the way i think there's no way that's not my mission to make you think exactly the way i think but here's the thing i can share with you what i think i can share with you what i believe father is saying I can share with you what I believe is, is going on in the realm of the spirit, and you can choose to embrace it or reject it. See, the writer said, harvest earth's vineyard because the grapes are bursting with ripeness. So if this word was written to them back in Bible days, then we can run with the word from our father and enlighten those who will hear this message of kingdom realities of our father's heart. So you can share kingdom realities, but you can't make people uh, embrace it, okay? It, it, we can share it, but it's up to people whether they embrace it or not. Now, I have a quote here today from uh, a minister by the name of Ray Prinzing. I believe he's uh, gone on now. 
but but uh, Ray was a kingdom-minded man, and this kingdom-minded man had some things to say. So I want to uh, share with you this portion uh, from Ray Prinzing. He said, God said to Moses, let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, Exodus 125, verse 8. But there was so much controversy in Israel and so much carnality of man that God finally said, I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art uh, a stiff-necked people. Y'all remember that. Lest I consume thee in the way. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it within, without the camp. And it came to pass that everyone that sought the Lord went out unto the tabernacle of the congregation, which was without the camp. Again, I think speaks of Jesus dying outside the city. God's presence was there, but not in closeness to the people because they were too stiff-necked and rebellious. As, and he who is a consuming fire would not move, uh, would have moved to purge and purify and consume them in the way. So they had to prepare a little plot of ground for him off, uh, afar off from the camp. This all this prefigured the greater spoken of uh, in Hebrews, where Jesus also, who might sanctify the people of his own blood, suffered without the gate or outside the city. And what we are admonished to go forth unto him without the camp, uh, afar off uh, from the camp on a little plot of ground set apart for him. He met with these people uh, who came out and sought after him. Remember, there, there were those who were stiff necked who would not seek him out. But there were those also who wanted to embrace this truth, even in an old covenant mentality. And so uh, it's very important that we understand uh, this, this concept. Uh, he finishes up by saying, um, and sanctified by him, ultimately is destined to become one of whom shall he shall uh, dwell in fullness, end quote. Now, here's the thing about it, folks. This is what they were faced with in an old covenant mindset. I see this even in the even in the book of Revelation. Uh, I see this that leading up to AD 70, there was an opportunity for people to embrace the mindset that Christ had tried to share and that the apostles revelation had to share. And even today, greater revelation is flowing forth and people choose to embrace it. I know there's people who click on my shows and they start watching and then all of a sudden they turn it off because they don't like what they're hearing. But see, folks, you know, when we talk about, for example, Bible college, if all we're going to teach you is the stuff you already know and then give you a degree, you're not really learning anything, okay? You might have some adjustments in what you know, but we don't only want to help make adjustments in what you were raised to believe, but we want to help teach you stuff you haven't embraced yet, bring you to a higher level of knowledge. Well, not only in Bible college, but in all of our broadcasts, in what we teach and preach on a regular basis. If it's not bringing you to a higher level of enlightenment, then you're really not gaining anything. Now, let's move on to Revelation 14, verse 20, uh, so we can wrap up chapter 14 today. And the winepress was trampled outside the city, and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridles for 1,600 Furloins. Now, I spoke to you in the beginning of today's lesson about how that the wine press really was symbolic of Jesus who was trampled or died outside the city and blood came forth from the wine press. Again, the furloughing is the Greek word stadion, meaning a certain measure of distance, and in this case, 1600 furloughs equal to about 184 miles. For me, the distance is not the big issue as it is the concept of this verse. So that's the thing. I'm not teaching this stuff verse by verse, or I mean, word by word and digging out every nook and cranny. Uh, that would take years, uh, although this has taken uh, uh, two or three. Uh, but uh, but the, 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 about the, the think about this statement, okay? Think about this in verse 20, which was caused, which has caused many to only think about the flowing of blood of the wine press, even unto the depth of the horse's, horse's bridles, and for a distance of uh, 1,600 furlongs. I want you to think about this because here's exactly what people equate this to. Uh, many people only think about some kind of battle of Armageddon as literal which only induces fear throughout what is known as the Christian and non-Christian world. 
in the Bible, we had the Jewish and the non-Jewish world. Jews and everybody else, okay? Jewish and non-Jewish. Now we have Christian and non-Christian world. When we have Jews and nobody else, then we segregate everybody else who was non-Jews. In other words, what we're saying is, is we kind of have a clue that we're the creation of God, but we also have a clue that you're not. The division of mankind is what's destroyed mankind up to this point. I'm telling you, sons and daughters of God are manifesting in this this new covenant revelation. And you know what's happening? We're changing our world. It's not the government that's changing our world. We're changing our world by what we declare, what we believe, and what we teach to others. Amen. All right. So it's not Armageddon. Uh, there is no literal battle of Armageddon. I want to say that again for somebody that's watching today. There is no literal art battle of Armageddon. It just doesn't exist. If you're believing that and you're waiting around for some future destruction of the world, some future worldwide battle, you're not going to see that. There is no future Armageddon with hundreds of thousands of soldiers and horses swimming in rivers of blood. You want to know where there was a river of blood? There's two rivers of blood we could easily uh, uh, trans, uh, uh, move into. One, the, the river of blood, so to speak, that flowed from Jesus. But also there was a river of blood in AD 70 when the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed. And people like Josephus, the great historian, actually uh, saw this river of blood that went on for days and days. And the blood of all those slain thousands of people is what put out the fire in Jerusalem in that time. So there's a lot of things we can equate to. Uh, but here's the thing. Uh, those who teach this as a literal futuristic event, uh, I'm just going to give you a, a, a suggestion, okay? You, you need to, you, you should consider uh, and stop to consider all the facts involved in what the prophets saw. Okay, when we take things out of context, we really get in trouble. We, what we, uh, what, what, uh, but what we, um, what this is, is a description of the harvest of the vineyard of the earthiness of man's thinking. So think about this. If you had a school, whether it's secular education, supernatural education, whatever level, and you taught people who didn't understand the things you were teaching them. I'm not talking about mind twisting. I'm not talking about brainwashing. I'm not talking about some cult where you twist people's minds. I'm talking about if you taught spiritual truth, you could show that in scripture, applied with the Greek and the Hebrew, and you could unveil this to people, and you could find, uh, you could begin to change how they think. Uh, so what would that be? Well, that would be a harvest of the vineyard of the earthiness of man's thinking. You would be changing the way people think. That wouldn't just be you, but it would be the power of the Holy Spirit that's flowing in you. You and Holy Spirit are one. And so let's let's conclude today with the harvest of what man thinks and what God thinks. No one can continue to teach the theology of this figurative harvest, which was to be followed by the great spiritual feasts of tabernacles. I'm not against the Feast of Tabernacles. If you want to teach tabernacles, I preached in celebrations of the Feast of Tabernacles, the, the, the Pentecost harvest. I preached some of those meetings. You know, I'm really not really not my forte of study, but as a Bible college instructor, there are things that I have to know, things that I'll have to study and prepare for to know. But the fact is, there's some things that we ought to stop teaching and stop making our majors and let them be our minors. Because the mindset of this future, of this first century, was, uh, was a literal view based on Old Testament prophecies. Now, here's the problem I have with that. Uh, if if you're going to base all of your theology, everything you teach on the revelation you get from Old Testament prophecies, chances are you will have a limited uh, mentality or a limited supernatural understanding. But if you're going to go before that and look at who God made you to be, you have to do by doing that. You have to look at who God is. So theology is the study of God. 
Theology is the study of God and his word. And you can't understand any written word that God actually said. R rip away the stuff that was canonized into scripture, take put in or taken out, uh, or the English words, all the words that you strip all that away and you find out what God actually said. Really to know God, uh, if you're studying theology, that's it. You got to understand God. And that would be an interesting uh, uh, study. So if you are who God made you as, uh, his reflection from before the foundation of the world, listen to this, then nothing has changed in the father's view, no matter how mankind has interpreted scripture or misinterpreted. So let me just say that again in another way. Uh, if your mindset, and I said something just a moment ago that, uh, that we're talking about the harvest of what man thinks uh, and what God thinks. And there's been a great difference between what man thinks and what God thinks. So if you're, if you're a reflection of who God says you are and he made you his reflection since before the foundation of the world, then no matter what mindset you've come to know, no matter what thinking you have at this moment in time, it doesn't change what God thinks. It doesn't change who God made you to be. It only changes your perception of that, right? So you can have a veiled perception. It will cause you have a, to have a veiled understanding. It will cause you to have a, a limited, uh, um, a, a limited uh, interaction with creation. It'll cause people to run away from you. It'll cause people to flee that hates religion and all these religious concepts. So to reach the world, to reach your own neighbors, you're going to have to have the mind of God. So even the so-called literalists, of our world are not literal, uh, not uh, of our world, but of, of that day are not literal in respect to the natural harvest of vintage of the grapes and the, the grain. So here's the thing. If there is not a literal harvest, okay, because we're talking about the book of Revelation, something that happened a long time ago. If there is not a literal harvest, then could this be a harvest of a supernatural nature? So I waited to the end to give you the punchline. So if there's not a literal harvest, and that was talking about something in AD 70, and to keep in mind, when you teach this, you, you, got, you keep flowing in and out of reading scripture as literal, but realizing it is a symbolic book uh, filled with spiritual meanings. So if there's no literal harvest, then really we're talking about a harvest of a supernatural nature. Also, no one can maintain that these are literal sickles, literal vines, and literal grapes. So once again, we see the harvest is of man's thinking and not a literal, uh, and, and now a literal rescuing of I mean, are we not rescuing mankind? Isn't that right? We're rescuing mankind by talking to them about what God thinks. Amen. All right. So this is very important. Um, now, let me see where I'm at here. Okay. So once again, the symbolic grapes were cast into the wine press of the passion of God. The passion of God speaks of the love of God for his creation. It's not a wine press of destruction, but the passion of the father's love for his creation. Not a wine press of destruction, because if you're going to put grapes in a wine press, the grapes are going to get be destroyed in one sense and transformed in another sense. So it's not a not destruction, but a product of the passion of the father's love. You got to understand that. You want to understand the Bible first, understand the father's love for all creation. This The statement concerning the blood reaching up to the horse's bridles is not to be interpreted literally. And yes, there is a, a, a explanation for that. You can study uh, the writings of J. Preston Eby and it'll take you on a real long ride, but, but you'll get some of the stuff. Here's the thing about it. It was used as a figure of speech denoting the shedding of blood, even as Jesus shed his blood, which represented the divine life. Look, Holy Spirit often uses 
figure of speech, like uh, symbolic language, uh, when conveying a deeper meaning than the one that appears on the surface. This is what I teach. The things that people see on the surface in scripture is a systematic theology, but that's only phase one. Phase two is the interlinear understanding, which means that which is written in between the lines. You say, but there's nothing written in between the lines. Oh, but there is. It's that which cannot be seen with human eyes or a human understanding, a carnal understanding. It's looking beyond the natural and seeing the revelation Holy Spirit is trying to reveal to you. John 6 verse 53 says, Jesus said, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, does this mean that somehow we are to literally eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood so that we can have life? I mean, do things like foot washing really cause a cleansing? If you're who you've always been as a spirit being, does communion actually cause a change of heart? Does all of these things we practice in Christendom, Christianity, really cause change? Or are you who you've always been? There are things that was practiced in that day for the purpose of getting people to pay attention, to think, to, to begin to open them up to a new realm. Uh, that see, see, to think that one has to eat the flesh of Jesus and drink his blood, uh, really cannibalism and, 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 and vampire uh, type mentalities. It would be an act of insanity. So what kind of blood is it that we see in the vision of the grapes that are being crushed? Again, it's not a description of some type of Armageddon, uh, 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 nor the Valley of Magneto, nor uh, uh, Megiddo, rather. Uh, uh, Armageddon is not even mentioned in this passage. It's not about the number of horses. It's not about soldiers. It's not about any kind of warfare except the battle individuals face in their own thinking. It's not about war. It's about harvest. I want to say it again. This whole message today is not about war. It's about harvest. And when we talk about a harvest of souls, we got to keep in mind that it, that uh, that mind uh, that the soul refers to the mind, will, intellect, and emotion. So, what are we trying to rescue? It's it's not void of emotions, but to exhibit the mental state or the same mind that was in Christ, which was the mind of the Father. Again, Philippians two. Verse five and six, let this mind be in you. We talked about this last night on the show. You need to go back and watch uh, Heal Because God Said So last night on the uh, the 9th of uh, April. It will be a great blessing to you. But when you think about this, notice this. Uh, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So what mind was in Christ Jesus? The Father's mind, right? Okay, so if the Father's mind was in Christ Jesus. Here's what he says. Uh, the writer says, uh, Paul says this, but who being in the form of God did not consider robbery to be equal with God. Now, we we sometimes have to read scripture and connect the dots, okay? And so if you're the, the express image of the Father, Jesus was the express image of the Father, and we're equal heirs, joint heirs, exact copies of Jesus, then the reality is, is we're just like our Father. Jesus did not consider it anything to hold on to a mindset that said we are equal or the same as Father God. Matthew 8, 16 says, and, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. The word spirits comes from the Greek word pneuma, which is a word we use for several things depending on context. So here we're not talking about uh, the Holy Spirit, but we're talking about in context, the human rational soul and implies man's mental disposition. Wow. Think about that. We're talking about man's mental disposition. We're talking about the thinking of man. The thinking of man needs to come in line with the thinking of God, right? And so you have a responsibility as kings and priests, as, as uh, images of the Father, to share his love with everyone you come in contact with. So as this new covenant remnant has come out of Christ and continues to emerge and be revealed to this generation, invisible made visible, 
We're bringing healing and order to the chaos in God's creation, to those who don't get it. We're going to have to be willing to embrace the idea of change in our own thinking regarding who we are in Christ so that we'll not fall apart as God works in us to bring about an end to some old mindsets. Once again, I ask the question, are you ready for what's next? Because what's next is the continuation of change. You'll continue to change. You'll continue to change in the very image, the very likeness, not in literal, but, but as a, as a, um, in your thinking, beginning to think like the father thinks. That is so important that we think like the father thinks. If you're not thinking like the father thinks, then you're thinking in some other mindset other than his, right? Amen. God bless you. And, um, and so stick with me on this journey as we continue to see more of the revelation unveiled, uh, uh, unveiling Christ in you, the hope of glory, Christ, the representation of the Father in you, the hope of glory. Uh, folks, I want to say this to you that we are, are uh, we are, uh, our heavenly position is being in the heavenly Christ, of uh, the heavenly mind of God. It's time to embrace heaven mindset right now in this life so we can experience heaven on earth. I hope you were inspired and blessed, got some information that will inspire you to study and dig deeper in this lesson. Uh, and next time we will be starting Revelation chapter 15, verse one. It's going to be a lot of fun. Join me then. And uh, I just want to say thank you everyone for watching today. Uh, you are a blessing. Um, uh, you're what makes these broadcasts what they are. So thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Uh, tomorrow night, uh, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time with Pastor Daniel Williams. Uh, Friday with Pastor Paul Gray as we talk about why Christ came. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're digging into some deep stuff. It'll be a blessing to you. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye, everyone.